Welcome and good morning. Nice to see lights on. That was good. As of 9.15 this morning, we had no lights on. We're thinking how the service is going to go, but this is a blessing and a benefit. It's good to be together. Our last song was about going to God in prayer, so let's begin uh, doing that before we get into the Word of God. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, in that song we talk about uh, coming to you with everything, and as our lives are uh, have its own cares and concerns, we come to leave those at your feet as we come into your Word. We pray that... Um, the concerns of the world would be laid aside just for a moment so that we could focus on you and the work of the Spirit within us. We pray that you would guide us through your word, that you would lead us so that we could be a blessing to others, and that you would use this time of worship to draw us closer to you and to one another. And we offer this prayer in Jesus' holy name. Amen. We've been going through a sermon series about developing community through fellowship and the different aspects and areas of fellowship. And we're already up to uh, the number nine sermon of the series, Fellowship with the Holy Spirit. And you'll see our one text today, our main text, is going to be from Romans chapter 8, 1 through 17. We're going to get into that and explain why that's a significant passage within our discussion. So just a reminder of the series that we've been going through. Within the series, we've been looking at fellowship, that is choosing to be with one another, that develops community, what we can develop as a group versus what we can just develop with on our own. Choosing to be with people so that we can have a broader influence, developing community through fellowship. Fellowship with those that oppose our faith or those that are enemies of the faith. And some people are enemies because they are ignorant. They They've heard the church teaches or Jesus teaches, but they don't know. And so we spend time with people of all kinds of backgrounds to be able to explain who Jesus is. We have fellowship with believers, uh, those that are the one another passages, and there's just so many of them. Fellowship with God, fellowship with unbelievers, the seekers in our lives, being that Matthew bridge to help people come to Jesus. Fellowship and forgiveness because we're going to fail others, they're going to fail us. Forgiveness is a part of that. Reconciliation is when the relationship is restored, it's patched back together. Last week was Emmanuel, how Jesus came to be with us, that he came to be with sinners, to be like us, to take on flesh, and that importance of fellowship. Today's fellowship with the Holy Spirit, God's promise of fellowship in Matthew 28, I will never leave you or forsake you, next week. And then... That's it. We end up, now we're into September, eternal fellowship in heaven. And that's where our series will finish up. So I hope that these concepts are important to you. And, and the question being, how have these topics and ideas impacted your head, impacted your heart, impacted your hands, impacted you in a way that you've encouraged and been encouraged with fellowship? Our series, and therefore summer itself, is quickly coming to an end, which has me thinking about, well, what's next? So my idea, at least is at this part, is to go back into the book of Romans. We've done topics for a while, but I think the book of Romans is going to be a powerful and impactful study, and with the idea of that I am not ashamed. Uh, what is it about the gospel message that we can declare with confidence and how is that beneficial to people around us. Today's section is from Romans chapter 8. It's a powerful impact and talking about the Holy Spirit. In our Thursday evening class, we've been doing uh, uh, studies and talking about the importance of major topics. And we did two weeks about the Holy Spirit where we looked at uh, some of the blessings, some of the connections, some of the simple thoughts, some of the complex thoughts about the Holy Spirit. So today we're going to be looking at the work of the Spirit in believers contrasted against the person that is led by their own spirit. The, the balance here, it's one way or the other. The idea of spiritual warfare, that our flesh, our inside, our sinful nature battles against God that wants the best for us. So, the contrast between living on one side or the other side. Before we get into Romans chapter 8, there's a few quotes I thought I could share that kind of get us in mind about what we're talking about with the 
Holy Spirit and questions related to it. J.B. Phillips said, every time we say, I believe in the Holy Spirit, we mean we believe that there is a living God, able and willing to enter human personality. But what's the next part? And change it. When we say we believe in the Spirit, it's not just a Spirit that exists out there, but a Spirit that can work within us to change us and challenge us, to help us to grow and to mature. That type of Spirit... So the question is, how has he changed you? Are you being changed by the Holy Spirit uh, in your attitude, in your action, in your awareness? How are you being changed? F.B. Meyer said, God does not fill us with the Holy Spirit to those who believe in the fullness of the Spirit or those who desire him, but who is filled with the Spirit? But those who obey him. It's not just wanting to be spirit-led. There's an obedience to being led by the spirit, an openness, which we'll get to at the end of the sermon. How are you connecting to the teaching of the spirit, and how are you responding about being changed and challenged by the spirit of God within you? Oswald Chambers said, the great idea is not that we are at work for God, but that he is at work where? In us. That he is working out a strong family likeness to his son in us. Not that just that we work for God, but that he is changing us individually to be a better reflection of Jesus. And as a church family, we become more of a mosaic of that, that people around us can see the Spirit of God within us, that we become more Christ-like. But the big question really is one of transformation. As people watched your life this week, what did they learn about the work of the Holy Spirit? What did they learn by example? What did they learn by discussion? What did they learn about the work of the Holy Spirit? As people who are exemplifying and showing fellowship with the Spirit. If the Holy Ghost is indwelling a man or woman, no matter how sweet how beautiful, how Christ-like they are, the lasting thought you go away with is what a wonderful being the Lord Jesus Christ is. Not that they're good people, which is nice to be known as a good person, but that there is something different within us because as people look at us, they see Jesus. That's what we want because the Spirit is here to help others see Jesus. Have people noticed the beauty of Jesus in you? What do they comment on on your reflection about Christ? So we're going to combine these thoughts about the work of the Holy Spirit, about following after the Spirit, about being changed by the Holy Spirit, about being more like Jesus because of the Holy Spirit as we look at Romans chapter 8. But Romans 8 isn't where we're going to start because we rarely start there. Romans 6, there's some thoughts that develop to get us to the importance of Romans 8. So, in Romans 6, there's some discussions. In Romans 6, we have the call to accept Christ in baptism, which is a call that we still offer today because it's important that we connect to Christ and he is the one that saves us. Forgiveness of sins and a new life in Christ for now and eternity are found in the grace of Jesus. We encourage people, we encourage one another to accept his gift and start your new life in Christ. That's the call in Romans 6 is to accept what Jesus is offering. We were talking about this this week in our Thursday class because we've been to- we were talking about baptism. And we read this passage. What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. The purpose of accepting Jesus and having him change us is so that we live a new life. Now, chapter 6 gives us this ideal, just come to Jesus and your life will change. But what's in the way is chapter 7. 
because chapter 7 talks about the war within. If we're promised a new life in Jesus in chapter 6, why doesn't it just happen? Why don't we just let go of the old and start the new and never have a struggle with the problems of the past? Well, Paul speaks about his own journey in chapter 7 as well. In chapter 6, we have the promise in the new life. In Romans 7, Paul has just laid out the truth that believers struggle with sin and the way to defeat the power of sin is through death. Not through more struggle, but through death. Unless we die to the old life, we'll be hounded by sin as a mean taskmaster. Release is only found in the death, burial, and resurrection. So there's the ideal life of chapter 6, the real life of the struggle of chapter 7. So how do you get between the two? How do you have less of the struggle of 7 and more of the ideal life of 6? Well, the answer's in chapter 8. So I like the way Paul lays it out, the reality that life doesn't just change just because you want it to. It is a work of the Spirit to change us and challenges us to a new life. So with those thoughts in mind, we begin chapter 8 with a therefore. Because of this struggle, therefore, there is now no condemnation. For who? For those who are in Christ Jesus. So who does have condemnation? For those that are not in Christ Jesus. An important concept he's already developed in chapter 6. Why is there no condemnation in Jesus? Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. Because in Christ, we have died to the old and it no longer has any power. That law, Jewish law, was a struggle and holding them back. It didn't give them the liberty, the freedom that they wanted. It just kept pointing out what they were doing wrong. For what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh. Now, depending on which even version of the NIV you're looking at, you'll have the term either flesh or sinful nature. And they go together. So our desire for sin is within us. And so when he uses the word flesh, he's talking about our desire to sin. The Greek word sarks. The law was powerless to do because it was weakened by our desire to sin. God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in who? Not just that it's fully met in Jesus, but that the requirement of a fully righteous life is fully met in us, in which us... Who are the ones that he's talking about? Who do not live according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. See the importance of that? It's fully met in us who do not live according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Live, conduct our life, led by. Conduct our life in the Spirit instead of the flesh. Our thought, our dedication... Our devotion is to following what the Spirit wants. Occasionally we still choose the flesh, but our desire is to choose the Spirit. We're devoted, if not exclusively, but we're trying to be. He talks about the importance of making this change. You're going to live one side or the other. Romans chapter 8, verse 5. Those who live according to the flesh, or the desire to sin have their minds set on what the flesh desires. But those who live according with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. So you see the first point of transition for if you want to be fully committed to Christ and live the Romans 6 new life, but chapter 7, I still struggle with sin, is in the way, the first point of dedication says, well, work with your mind. Commit your mind to God. And so the importance of the mind is where we're going. And that is mindfulness. Pay attention to your thoughts, your process. The mind 
governed by the flesh is death. The mind controlled, that's the older NIV, regulated, manipulated by the flesh is death. But the mind governed, led, controlled by the spirit, what type of life is that? It's life and peace. The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, and then it's pretty pointed, nor can it do so. If you're focused on pleasing sin, you cannot submit to God's law. Because God's law is against that very nature. It's trying to help you not be that type of person, nor can it do so. But if you don't want to change your mind, what's the result of an unchanged mind? Those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. If you won't consider thinking differently, patterning your life differently, surrendering to the guidance of the Spirit, if, if your mind won't change, your life won't change. And you cannot please God. That's why the struggle is so important. Because it is a surrender to letting God change your mind. Not just that you change your mind. As we get into verse 9, you, however, are not in the realm of the flesh. You're not even in that realm. I like that this is the newer end of it. I like the way that it says you're not in the realm of it. You're not under its control. You're not in that kingdom. You're not in the realm of the flesh. You're in the realm of the spirit. But how do you know that you're in that right realm? If indeed the Spirit of God lives in you. And if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. We talked about in our Thursday study being marked with the Holy Spirit, the guarantee of our salvation. If the Spirit's not within us, we don't belong to Christ. Not in the same sense eternally. But with the Spirit within us, we belong to Christ. When we get to verse 10, that was the negative. But if Christ is in you, then even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the Spirit gives life because of righteousness. Because of a right relationship with Jesus, God, the Spirit, your life is full is given life because of the spirits. Not just the decay that sin brings, we're actually, as the body declines, the spiritual side can grow and be more healthy. It's a promise in chapter 8. The spirit, the spirit of truth, the spirit of holiness, the spirit of life, the spirit of grace, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. That's the little lines that are on there, a little hard to see but the spirit of life. And if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is doing what? Not just near you, but is living in you. He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his spirit who lives in you. We have to have fellowship with the Spirit. The Spirit wants not just external fellowship. The Spirit wants to dwell with us, to live with us. Like we looked at last week with Jesus being incarnate, taking on flesh, the, uh, the one who God with us, our Emmanuel. The Spirit wants to live in us. Therefore, sin needs to be removed. So in verse 12... It says, therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation, but it is not to the flesh to live according to it. For if you live according to the flesh, what's the result of that? You'll die. Just pleasing your sinful nature just leads to more destruction. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. Those who live and who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. Which side are you going to follow after? The work of the Holy Spirit or the work of your sinful nature within you? The children of God, for the Spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you fear again. Now, we have no condemnation because of Christ Jesus, Romans 8, 31 through 39. 
Rather, the spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship, and by him we cry, Abba, Father. The spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. This transformation of knowing that God's telling you, I have adopted you, and yourself knowing that you've been adopted, and those confirming one another. God saying, I've accepted you, and you reminding yourself by the Spirit, I've been accepted. That's going on at the same time, knowing that you are in a child of God. So we're just about got this wrapped up. Now, if we're children, then we're heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, Conditional sentence, if indeed we share in his sufferings, in order that we may also share in his glory. And that to me kind of brings us back to the chapter 7 part to say it's not done yet. You're still going to struggle. You're still going to say, but my sinful nature is there. But which side do you, you know, which wolf do you want to feed? If you want to feed the spirit, you'll become more spiritual. But if you want to feed the flesh, you'll be drawn away from God. And that's the destruction that we can bring into our own lives. If indeed. But sharing in his sufferings is part of what also brings him glory. The blessing of the Spirit has a cost. If we choose to surrender to God and die to our old thinking and living, that death will lead us to suffer, but it will also end in glory. Being Spirit-focused doesn't mean that life is easy. It means we struggle differently. And some parts are acceptable, some parts are easy, and some parts are more difficult because of it. But the new life promised in chapter 6 involves the struggle of 7, but is empowered by chapter 8, the work of the Spirit. Why we need fellowship with the Spirit. One of the works of the Spirit is to fill us and purge us of our old way of life. Pumping out the old, drawing in the new. Pumping out the old, drawing in the new. Purging the old life, getting rid of old thoughts, old behaviors, old patterns. And guess what? It takes time. But the Spirit is there to do that. He makes room for God to work in our lives. The Spirit bridges our flesh with our spirit. So be able to help us communicate to God and God to us. To help us focus on the spiritual instead of the physical. To help us think in a different realm and focus. Without the Spirit, we soon become slaves again to sin. But with the Spirit, we can serve God and His righteousness. We want a right relationship with God. So that's who we serve as our new master. We need to be in fellowship with the Spirit to live a spiritual life. Amen. Not just the Spirit is off somewhere else doing its own thing, but to be in fellowship, to be, have the Spirit invited in to l not only live with us once, to cleanse us, but to live with us, stay with us, teach us a new way in our mind and in our behavior, in our attitude. We need to be in fellowship with the Spirit. We want to develop community with Him and with those who He calls into the same community through the Spirit. That's why we also need one another to say, I see you changing in this area. Why am I not? Can you help me in that? Well, for me, it started with and have that conversation about how the Spirit is at work within us, how we resist the Spirit, how we invite the Spirit. It takes community. No matter who we are, we all struggle with sin and its desire to take us hostage again. Amen. Does Satan just give up? No. Sin, our desire to be selfish, our desire to be prideful, there's always the temptation. It can always get in the way. We have the chance and the choice to be sinners who have accepted salvation and who are becoming more holy through choice and surrender. Perfect in his eyes, but having the old life pushed out and the new life pushed in. It's good news for everyone, and we all need hope. Amen. This is the fellowship that we offer to everyone. Come, accept salvation, be cleansed of your sin, and have the Spirit within to change you through time. And be okay with the process. But there's the struggle. Why don't I just change? 
right? I don't know, has anybody else ever asked that question? Why didn't it just happen? Why didn't I just become what I wanted to be? Well, I'm going to give us a little object lesson that speaks about the contrast in the question, why our lives change at such a slow pace, why we struggle with sin even after we've surrendered to God in baptism through our death, burial, and resurrection represented in baptism. So what I have over here, two glasses, and some water. And then two packages. What happens when you put Elka Seltzer in water? Does it have an action? <laughs> How much Elka Seltzer is in the water? Well, what happened? <laughs> what? Is that significant? How much Alka Seltzer is in this one? Well, guess what's happening? The top of that package is cut off. So what's going to slowly happen? There's going to be a change. But does it happen immediately? How much Alka Seltzer is in this one? How much Alka Seltzer is in this one? What's the difference? Which one's open to seeing the power of it? And that's why our lives sometimes don't change it the way that we want it to. Because we're really not open to the Spirit. Just having access. And when the Spirit has access to us, not us access to Him, the Spirit is there. But do we want to access it? Do we want the Spirit to change us? And that's a difference in the process. It's not how much of it is there. It's how much of you does the Spirit have. Not how much of the Spirit do you have, but how much of you does the Spirit have. How do we open ourselves up? Well, we open ourselves up and offer ourselves to him in wholeness. Then you'll experience the difference that surrender makes. Open yourself up and offer yourself in a variety of ways, right? Through prayer, worship, reading, fellowship. Opens ourselves up to letting the Spirit change us and challenge us. And that's where the difference takes place. So the challenge this week is to be aware of the opportunities you have for the Spirit to change you, to open yourself up to wanting to be changed, to invite the Spirit in to change you so that you can be a difference not only for your life, but for the benefit of others. Next week's passage is Matthew 28. Matthew 28, 20. The promise from Jesus that Jesus says that he would never never leave us. The importance of that promise for us today and for each generation thereafter. Thank you for your time and attention.